Hello everybody and welcome to the next recording of our GOR working group meeting on mathematical optimization and quantum computing. Have fun watching our videos and thanks again to the speakers for their presentations and for their permission to publish these. This is the second episode with a presentation from Wolfgang Lechner. Right, everybody, welcome back to our uh, virtual event. Uh, our next speaker is Wolfgang Lechner. He is Associate Professor at the University of Innsbruck and CEO at Parity Computing, Quant sorry, Parity Quantum Computing. Uh, and he will now present on encoding the real world problems on current quantum hardware. Looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, let me really thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk here. Uh, I think we are talking much too often to physicists, <laughs> so I, I, I really uh, enjoy being here uh, with mathematicians and I would actually love to, to do some collaborations with, with uh, mathematics institutes. So if after the talk uh, you're interested in what we're doing, uh, please just drop me an email about that. Um, so what I would like to talk about is more or less an alternative to encode uh, optimization problems to what we've just seen before, uh, where we basically circumvent this translation to these quadratic uh, problems. And let me start with giving you a motivation to do this. So what we usually do in quantum computing, we start with the hardware that we have available. And then we think about algorithms that best fit this hardware. And this means, for example, with a superconducting cube, it's like the DWF chip, uh, we know, okay, we have nearest neighbors with a 2D chip and we have a pair interactions, which means the natural uh, fit would be this quadratic unconstrained optimization problems. Or uh, if we have neutral atoms, so this is for uh, people are building quantum computers, then there is, you know, different interactions, different, different ways how this works. And people, for example, in physics, then look at the so-called Hubbard model, which is a model for uh, some physical properties of metals. Now, right now with this industrial revolution, more or less in the quantum community, this starts to turn around now. So now uh, is a time where people really start thinking also in the other direction by saying, okay, uh, let's say I have a problem given, what is actually the best algorithm for that? And what are my hardware requirements to solve this problem? And I think this is now a very exciting time because this can now go forth and back and uh, there will be some joint, or there is now some joint development of this hardware and software. And one thing that we found out by going in this direction, by talking um, to people like you, and I hope to get even more input about that. If you look at optimization problems, then they're usually not in this quadratic form, but they're in, in higher order forms, so some nonlinear functions or some side conditions. No? So this means uh, on top of your optimization problem, you also have constraints. Uh, and they are highly non-local in the sense that uh, geometrically non-local. So uh, this means if I have a graph, then this graph can have arbitrary uh, connectivity. So this means uh, industry relevant or real world prob or, uh, problems of, of high interest uh, have this uh, higher, higher order terms, they are constrained and they are not quadratic or unconstrained. And this, uh, as we just heard before, leads to the fact that we have to uh, first decompose these problems. And this is something that uh, I would like to present how we can actually avoid this. Um, so the good thing uh, about Elizabeth's talk was that I don't have to introduce now the translation from the optimization problem to the spin models uh, in detail. Um, I just want to give one example. So imagine you have a, the graph partitioning problem, which means you have a graph uh, with uh, uh, vert uh, vertices and edges, and you want to uh, decompose it in two subsets, which are equal size, such that the number of edges connecting them is minimized, this is MP hard problem. And the way this is translated to a spin model is as follows. So the first step that we do is we put a spin, so a zero and one on each of the nodes. And then the general strategy is always to translate the cost function of the problem into an energy of a spin model. 
So this means in this case, uh, what we do is we say, okay, if um, the spin is plus one, then it's uh, part of one set, let's say the green set or the red set. And if it's minus one, it's the other set. And then we just take the sentence uh, up there and translate it into an energy. So the first part of the sentence says that the two subsets should have the same size. And this we can represent as an as a energy. Uh, so in physics, we always write the energy as an H, um, which looks like this. So we have a sum of the sigmas. Uh, and then we square it, which means if there's equally many red, so equally many plus one and minus ones, then this gives us zero. In, an other, in any other way, it gives us uh, something positive. So this means uh, this energy term takes care about the fact that the two subsets are the same size. And then the second part is that the connections between the two sets is minimized. So this means uh, the more connections there are between the subsets, the larger the energy should be. Of all the edges, and if minus sigma i sigma j half, it's uh, an edge connecting the two. And the, the solution is then uh, some configuration. So this means the solution is then a set of plus and minus ones in this graph that minimize this. And now, if I look at these terms, then I see on a, uh, what I always get out is something that has this, this form of uh, interaction matrix and um, sigma c, sigma c, exactly as we saw in Elizabeth's talk. However, real world problems don't look like this. So this is a, a simple example. Real world problems have functions in them. They have uh, higher order terms and constraints. So this means uh, the way this is done currently, and we've also seen this, if we have higher order correlations, they are first translated in a Kubo problem. And then the Kubo is uh, put on a chip, which uh, usually gives us um, an overhead in qubits. Secondly, if we have constraints, uh, then this is something that uh, gives us a lot of uh, energy scales. And the reason is the following. So imagine uh, we have a constraint. So a constraint can have two forms, either a product or a sum. So for example, if I want to force that sigma one times sigma two, so two spins in my system are plus one, then uh, what I have to do in order to make this unconstrained problem, I have to basically soften this constraint, which means I put a very strong energy between one and two. So in physics, we call this a ferromagnetic bond, which basically means that the two spins are forced to point in the same direction. And this introduces an additional energy scale to the system. And this is a problem for a quantum algorithm uh, because uh, we have to introduce a large, a large separation of, uh, of energy. And the same is true for some constraints. So what I uh, want to present now is an alternative to the spin model. Uh, and this is uh, the so-called parity paradigm, or uh, sometimes this is also called uh, or, uh, a lattice gauge model. And um, I first just show you how it looks like, and then I, I want to derive it. Um, so what you see on the left is uh, the so-called Kubo paradigm. So we have uh, a model which is of quadratic form, which means we have pair interactions. And what we have to program there is the JIJ matrices. So this means the interaction between qubits. What you see on the right side is the same problem, but represented in the parity paradigm. And what you see here now is that the, the, the terms or the Hamiltonian or the energy contains uh, two terms. The first one is a single body term. So this is a, is a local field that acts on single qubits. And I labeled the prefactor J actually the, uh, the numbers from the interactions on the left side. So this means the interactions on the, on the spin model or the, weight, the weights of the edges in the mathematical language becomes a, a local field on single qubits. So this means this would be a, a bias on the nodes in the mathematical way to say it, or in the physical way, a local field acting on single spins. And the interaction part, so the, the second part on the right side, 
is now a four body term. So this means on the right side, there's no pair interactions anymore. So there's no, uh, no graph anymore. The only thing that I have left is single body interactions and four body interactions. And the interesting thing about this is now that the four body interactions are the only interactions that are left and they are independent of the problem. So this means you have somehow separated the problem from the hardware because uh, it's like uh, almost like introducing a software layer, uh, which uh, allows one to build the same chip for all problems and encode everything only in the local fields while the interactions are completely independent of the problem. So this, uh, the summary uh, is below here. So the problem, uh, the interactions are problem independent. We can encode higher order terms without overhead and we can cons encode constraints without overhead. And uh, the, the first or the original publication about this uh, we wrote in 2015, uh, but there is uh, several follow-ups since then. So um, this here, I just want to cite the original uh, paper. So uh, let me derive now how this works. So what I want to do is I want to show you how I translate from a spin model to the parity model. And the first step that I do is I introduce uh, edge variables uh, or parity variables, um, which means I introduce uh, spins that represent the relative coordination of two original logical spins. So we call now the pro problem, the logical problem and the physical spins are the ones that are built on my quantum device. So the logical ones, they represent the original problem and they are blue and their errors and the, uh, the physical ones are green and ones and zeros, but they are just spins. So I just did this to, to distinguish them now. And what they are, they are uh, just like the product of the two. So this means the truth table uh, looks like this. So if two spins are pointing in the same direction, then the spin is up. And if they're pointing in different direction then they are down. So it represents the, the so-called parity of the two spins. Now, if I look now at a term uh, as we had it before, you know, like J, J sigma C sigma C, and I write this in these new variables, then uh, a lot of magic already happens you know, because uh, the new variables are just a product of two, which means each term in this double sum becomes a term in a single sum. And you already see that the prefactor, the weight, uh, of the uh, of the um, of the edge becomes like a local field acting on these new spins. However, uh, this is not an equation. Uh, this cannot be an equation because the number of degrees of freedom is different. So, if you look at the left side, even though you have the same number of elements, no, because on the left it's a double sum, so you have a, a n squared elements. You only have n degrees of freedom because there's only n spins. While on the right side, you really have n squared spin, so the number of edges, uh, which would be n times n minus one half, um, you have n squared spins and thus n squared degrees of freedom, which means the strategy is now to introduce, so which means you have a larger space, right? So you, you increased your, uh, your Hilbert space. And now the strategy is to, to restrict your Hilbert space again to, this, to the relevant space on the left side. And this is done by introducing K minus N constraints. So this means every constraint uh, restricts uh, or halves the Hilbert space. And uh, if we have K degrees of freedom on the left side and N on the right side, if we add K minus N degrees of, uh, K minus N constraints, we restrict ourselves to the, to the correct subspace. So now we just have to find these constraints. And uh, again, uh, or the, the answer is, these constraints are constructed from closed loops. So what does this mean? So if we have a closed loop, uh, we have as many edge, edges as nodes, right? So on the left side, for example, there is a closed loop, one, two, three, which means we have uh, three edge variables, one, two, two, three, and one, three. And now we can uh, write again a truth table between these three spins. So the original 
So we want the new one. So for example, on the top line, if all spins are pointing up, then also all edge variables point up. If all spins are pointing down, then also all edge variables point up because all spins are pointing in the same direction. So we can make a full list. And then uh, we can try to translate back from the right side to the left side. And if you look at the at the bottom example, so uh, one, two is one, one, three is one, and two, three is uh, minus one or zero. Um, then we see that there is no correspondent uh, original spin configuration that can satisfy this, no? Because one, two want to point in the same direction and one and three want to point in the same direction, which, which forces two and three to also point in the same direction. So this means in this truth table on the right side, the number of spin down must be an even number. Otherwise there is no corresponding uh, configuration. And this allows us now to construct exactly such a constraint. So these are the conditions actually to, to, to restrict our space. And this we can now write as a physical constraint. Now we always have to represent everything as energies. And the way we can do this is by just multiplying them. So if you uh, multiply sigma one, two times two, three times one, three, and put a minus in front, then you always get minus one if you have uh, if you satisfy the condition. So the condition is that the number of spin downs is uh, even. And if you have an odd configuration, then this gives you a plus one. So this means you always separate then the allowed space from the not allowed space. And uh, by putting a, a C in front, so if you make the constraint very large, then this uh, separates then these energies to such an extent that uh, your whole system then lives in this uh, subspace of allowed states. And now this mathematical condition, though, that on a closed loop, the number of spin down must be even, this is true for any closed loop. Uh, so the, it, it must be a, a, a spanning tree with one connection then, so it, it's not allowed to have like a, a two sub uh, loops or a, a loop with a crossing. Um, so it must be um, a closed cycle. And uh, then this condition is always true. So in this example with four spins, you again have four edge spins. And uh, again, you can construct out of this then a four body term. And now the question is, which closed loops should I choose in order to uh, represent a fully connected graph like this one? And it turns out uh, that first of all, if I just count the number of closed uh, cycles that I have, right? So uh, there is uh, n factorial closed cycles, which means there's more than I need because I need k minus n, and that's a quadratic number. So this means um, I have to actually select a few of them. And now I want to select them in a, in a certain way. I want to select them in such a way that the, the physical interactions that I have to build in the end on my quantum chip are among nearest neighbors, because this is something that I can physically realize. And it turns out that there is only one solution and I just want to show you this solution. Uh, the solution is uh, this pattern. So I, uh, I start at two and then I go one to the right, two left, three to the right and two back. And now uh, on the right side, I draw the corresponding uh, edge spins and I order them by the difference between the two indices. So I start with one, two, three, four, five, and then I just uh, draw them here. So two, three has distance one, so I put them here. Then uh, one, three, and two, four have distance two, I put them here, and one, four, distance three, I put them here. So this gives me now my first constraint that I have to uh, realize. And now uh, for this particular example, so if I have six, um, logical uh, six nodes and uh, n, uh, n times n minus one half uh, edges, I need in total, um, so n times n minus one half is uh, 10, um, and I need in total six constraints. So 10 qubits and six, uh, 10 constraints, sorry, uh, I need 10 constraints. And now I've put uh, two, um, so I have to find uh, eight other ones. And the way I do this is I now take the pattern that I just had and I move it 
one to the right. So I take the same pattern, just move it one to the right. So this means the elements are three, four, two, four, two, five, and three, five. And now I observe that two, four is already placed, right? So I can just add the, the, the other three on the right side and I have another constraint. Then I move it one to the right again. Uh, I see that three, five is already there and so on. So this means no matter how large my system is, I just go once through the system. So I've placed three constraints now, and as I said, I need 10 in total. Now, the, the, the next step is that I take my pattern and stretch it by one. So now I go, I start with two to the right, three back, four to the right, three back. And now if I look at the elements, one, four, two, five, two, four, and one, five, I see that three of them are already there. So three of them, I've already placed, so I can just put the fourth one here and uh, I, have, I have a new constraint. And this now works, uh, I continue like this, now I move one to the right uh, until I hit the end, then I stretch it again. And with this, I build this pyramid. And now, uh, as you can see with this, we have generated now uh, six constraints. So I still need four, four additional ones. And they are actually already there. Uh, they are here at the edge. So at this bottom edge here, uh, I actually see that I have these constraints of length three now. So here I have one, two, two, three, one, three. Then this triangle, this triangle, and this triangle one uh, are uh, constraints of length three. So this means the model that I get out is I have now a row of free body terms and a, uh, a bulk of four body terms and uh, this I can then even correct a bit uh, for, for physicists is often good to have all the interactions the same. So what we can actually do is we can put here on the bottom row spins which are fixed to plus one. And uh, by doing so, we can uh, translate a three body term trivially to a four body term, no, because it's just multiplying by plus one. So uh, this means we can generate a system where all the interactions are exactly the same. So it's completely uniform. So one way to express this is that it's a model no, which has, which is somehow this triangle shape graph. It's a hypergraph, no? so we have always four body terms and one side is fixed and the two other sides are open. So it, it's, uh, it's also a new model um, which has not been studied yet and uh, something that we are uh, very much looking into now. Now, until now, what we've seen is, okay, we can represent uh, a graph with n nodes and k edges uh, by k uh, nodes. And uh, we did this by introducing these closed cycles. And we used them these particular cycles for, to get a space filling layout. Now, what about graphs that are not all to all, but less than all to all? So here on the left side, you see a D regular graph, which means, so it's N equals six and D equals three. So this means that there is six nodes and each node is connected to three edges. And uh, this graph obviously is not all to all. No? For example, one three is missing, one five is missing uh, and so on. So this means if I would now just follow uh, our construction, by the way, this is often called LHZ construction. So if I follow just this construction, uh, I would still have to place all my spins. I need to place n squared spins, but the ones that are missing just have a local field zero or a bias, which is zero, which means this spin here doesn't care if it's pointing up or down. So it's a completely useless spin. And I actually would like to remove it because uh, removing spins is, is, uh, is always advantageous for, for the quantum computation then. So what I want to do is I would like to compile this problem now. So this graph in this new representation. And the way this works is uh, that we can now actually go back to the original idea and just select arbitrary closed loops and then put them together like puzzle pieces in such a way that they're giving space filling tiles. So in this, this D regular graph, for example, this has uh, five possible closed loops of length uh, four and three. So by the way, we are um, in this presentation, I only show 
uh, three and four because um, with this I can make a square lattice. However, if you have a honeycomb lattice or a kagome lattice or a more complicated lattice, you can also take loops of uh, six or, or whatever you want. So here we look only at uh, three and four. And so for this particular example, these are the five possible loops. And then I can actually try to put them together. And it turns out for this particular example, I can actually uh, put them together in a extremely elegant way. So I have only nine uh, qubits or nine spins left. And as if you count here, the number of edges, this is exactly nine. So we have no additional uh, uh, spins that we actually don't need. Uh, and we have a, a very nice square lattice. So it's, it's a, a very nice compiled graph. Uh, and if you count the number of degrees of freedom, uh, you see that it's k minus n plus one. Uh, the number of constraints is k minus n plus one. Uh, so k is nine, n is six, plus one is four. And this is the number of constraints that we need. So it's exactly four. Uh, by the way, uh, this formula, this is uh, very intriguing. So it, it says the number of constraints that I need is k minus n plus one. And this is purely motivated from these uh, loops and from degrees of freedom counting and physics, right? But it's exactly the Euler formula for planar graphs. So you probably know the, the number of faces minus the number of nodes plus the number of edges equals two. Uh, so Euler had plus two, I have plus one. The reason is that Euler also counted the outside as a, as a face, uh, but it's exactly the same formula. And this is a very intriguing connection, uh, which uh, I think uh, has to be understood. <laughs> um, okay, now, uh, the second question that I want to address is the, the question of higher order terms. So until now, we only looked at graphs, but what happens if I look at a hypergraph? So, uh, and in order to do this, let us first generalize our definition of a cycle. Um, so what we, what we found was you know, that our constraints are constructed from cycles and Actually, the reason why this is the case is the following. Or why did we actually find out that cycles is what we need for constraints? The reason is the following. Um, our parity variables, which sit on the edges, they are actually a product of the two nodes, right? So they are uh, always the product of the two nodes. And then the, the term that I write down in the end is a product of these products, right? So I have always a product of two, and then what I have to, what I write down is a product of four of these new spins. And if I write this now out again in the original spins, then what I see is that this is a product of eight terms now. And because this is a closed cycle, each index occurs twice. No, because I end up where I started. And this means this always gives us plus one. It's impossible to get minus one. And this is then also the reason why this is a constraint. But now we can say, well, imagine that this, uh, these terms are now not coming from a graph, but from a hypergraph, right? Where these are products of three or four or five. Then I can still use the same rule, namely that the occurrence of the indices is even. And this gives me again a, a constraint. So with this, we can actually define closed cycles in hypergraphs. And um, now if you, if you look at this, for example, let's say you have this hypergraph, so uh, which has four two-body terms and two three-body terms. So I've drawn the, the two-body terms as lines and the three-body terms uh, with these rectangles. Um, I can now again translate each term into a parity variable. So this means each product that's here becomes one variable. And for example, then the variable one, two, three is just the product one, two, three. So it measures the parity of one, two, and three. And if I now look at this, I can actually construct a constraint out of these four terms, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three. Because if I multiply them, the product is always plus one. So this must be plus one. And with this, I can now again, Look at 
So I would decompose this. So if I would decompose this first into a Kubo problem and then uh, put it on a on a graph, then for this simple problem, I already need 32 qubits. If I do this with our compiler, I can actually represent the same problem only with six qubits because I have six terms here and each of the terms is one qubit. And uh, not just that I reduce the number of qubits, I always get this extremely regular pattern. So it's always this, this square lattice with the four body terms. And the compiler can do this now with arbitrary graphs. Um, so what the compiler does, it takes all possible uh, loops and then puts them together. It can also add auxiliary qubits. So sometimes you need uh, an edge which actually doesn't exist just to fill out uh, the, the rest in a space filling way. And this here is a gallery of outcomes. So this is an outcome of our compiler where we show that there's like this fundamental connection between these graphs and these parity graphs. So uh, on the left side is always the original graph on the right side, the parity um, representation of it. And as you can see, if there are symmetries on the, in, the, in the graph, then there's also symmetries in, in this parity representation. So it's an extremely intriguing transformation uh, that I enjoy working on uh, every single day. And if you, just as a, as a teaser, so for example, if you then have very complicated Hamiltonians like this one, uh, you, you, you need like 100 qubits uh, if you do this with a, a cubo and then implementation. And here you always get these very simple graphs out. Okay, then uh, the second part or the second uh, intriguing feature is the constraints. So if on top of my optimization problem, I have, I have a list of side conditions. Then if I translate this into a Kubo problem, then I introduce large energy scales, which leads to um, unwanted effects in the quantum community. Now with our compiler or with our parity transformation, we can do a mathematical trick. And the trick is the following. Imagine you have the condition the side condition that sigma two times sigma three equals plus one. So this means whatever solution you get, you want that two and three point in the same direction. Now, if you want to do this in a spin model, what you have to do is you have to make a very strong a negative interaction here, which means that it, a strong ferromagnetic interaction, which aligns them in the same direction. Now with the parity transformation, you can do a mathematical trick. Namely, you can say, well, Let's not take a closed loop of four, but actually let's take a closed loop of five, where this constraint is one of the, of the edges. Because it is now plus one, I can just mathematically remove it, right? Because if I multiply one, two, one, six, uh, five, six, and three, five, and if I just multiply this by plus one, it doesn't change anything. So this means, I can actually take a closed loop of five now where two three is included and implement it as a four body constraint in my chip. So this means here I have now one, two, three, five, one, six, and five, six, which is this closed loop. And as you can see, the, the two three disappeared. And this makes also sense, right? If I have an optimization problem in the side condition, it actually halves my, my search space. So it reduces my search space. So it makes sense that I should be able to also remove a degree of freedom. But usually I, I don't have the possibility to do this no? because my problem is not represented in such a way that I can just take out the degree of freedom. But in the parity transformation, you can. And this means for each side condition, you actually remove a spin. And uh, just to, to, so if you wonder, okay, where is then my spin? It's actually hidden inside here because if you look at the indices of this loop, then you see that all indices occur twice except for two and three. So this means with the, the, they are encoded by not being encoded in here, no? So. <laughs> So with every constraint, we can remove a qubit and this then leads to a spectacular benchmark. So the problem that you see here on the left is some complicated um, term with up to five body terms. And then we have a list of constraints. And if you would translate this uh, with, uh, with the D-Wave compiler, you need 728 uh, qubits on a chip. 
And with our compiler, you can actually map this on 52 qubits. And, uh, and again, you have this regular pattern. So this is a, a very, um, I would say, a, a, a different way to, to encode uh, this problem, which often allows you to remove the qubits and reduce the overhead, in particular, if you have this large uh, k-body terms and this list of side conditions. OK, so uh, in the last 10 minutes, let me show you some uh, some benchmarks. So the the, the first thing uh, to or the one very important thing is again a physics thing, um, but maybe you still like it. Um, and this is the following. So if you build a quantum chip, then uh, you have to somehow uh, execute your your gates. And just like in a classical computer where we have uh, not uh, uh, where we have uh, end and or gates and so on. For the quantum computer, there is also fundamental sets of gates. And one of the most fundamental ones is the so-called controlled not gate. So it's, uh, it means if you have, you have one control uh, bit, uh, and if the control bit is one, then it switches the other one. Otherwise, it doesn't switch it. And um, this is a, a gate that we can implement in different uh, platforms. And now if we want to implement these four body terms that I've just shown, so on the plaquette uh, for each of these four body terms, I want to encode them. Uh, this is actually a sequence of gates that looks like this. So I have my four uh, spins or my four bits uh, now drawn as lines. And then I need six operations between them. So, and they, they look like this ladder, you know? So I have C0, 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 then a single qubit rotation, C0, C0, C0. And um, the, if I now look at, or if I now implement this on my chip, so this would be you know, my chip and the lines is not gates, then I can see that they, are, they have this extremely regular pattern. You know? So all of these uh, spins, uh, all of these interactions more or less happen com completely the same way. And this is now completely independent of the problem itself. So this means I don't have to do any compilation for the interactions. The interactions are always exactly the same. They're always these, these regular patterns of C0 gates, which means I can then design a quantum computer which executes these patterns down here. So the lines here will be always interactions between two bits or qubits. And I just have to execute these patterns and then I've executed my whole algorithm. So it's, it's, it would be like a, a, a classical algorithm which, which always does exactly the same operations, but it changes the local operation on the single bits. So like single spin flips. And uh, this somehow reminds me about these uh, weaving patterns. You know? So uh, in the old or the, the first computers in general uh, were uh, weaving uh, uh, machines you know, which were programmed. and. I kind of like this analogy that now we are back to weaving patterns on the quantum computer. Okay, so um, just as a, a small benchmark outlook, so we, uh, we have uh, we will publish our benchmark soon, but this is just a, a short preview. So once we have two and three body and four body terms, we can actually compare our compiler uh, to the the D wave compiler, for example. And one remarkable thing that we see is that for randomly generated instances, so all dots that you see are uh, random instances of uh, problem of the same problem class. Um, then first of all, uh, the number the the number of qubits is a factor ten smaller for for small systems. So this is already nice for the uh, for the current era, no? Because uh, right now. People are struggling to build qubits, so the less qubits, the better. And this is about a factor ten. So this means on a, a twenty, uh, on a I don't know hundred qubit chip, we can encode something that otherwise needs a thousand qubits. And um, but what's even more important, of course, is the scaling. And it turns out that there is a quadratic scaling, which means uh, we need quadratically less uh, qubits. And quadratically less qubits is quite. Um, a large is, is very important because all these probabilities 
they scale exponentially with the number of qubits. So if you have an algorithm with, uh, with n qubits, then the probability to get the ground state goes with e to the minus n. Uh, so this means a quadratic improvement in uh, qubits is an exponential improvement in, uh, in the runtime. So this is uh, quite remarkable. Um, on the other hand, there's also a reduction in the, for the so-called gate models. So, so this benchmark would be for a annealing-like protocol. However, there's also gate-based quantum computers. And for gate-based quantum computers, uh, the trade-off might be another one, namely what they want to minimize is the number of these C0 gates. And uh, here we also have benchmarks for this, and I just want to illustrate this. So with our compiler, what you basically do is you, re you reduce everything in this mathematical way uh, to nearest neighbor problems. And the, the price that you pay is that you increase the number of qubits. So this means the situations that you always get out is that we increase the number of qubits, but we reduce the number of operations. And this trade-off is extremely interesting because uh, these C0 gates, they have errors. So if they would be error-free, it would always be better to choose the smaller Hilbert space. However, once you have errors in the interactions, and this is what you always have, uh, you actually uh, gain because uh, the errors uh, continue. And uh, so to say, by having less operations, you get a better fidelity. And uh, so this graph here, just to show you, is on the uh, on the y-axis, this means the quality of the result. So we call this the fidelity f. And on the x-axis is the error in your C0 gates. And uh, the two important uh, lines is the red one. So this is our architecture. And the gate model is the blue one. And the gate model is really the standard model for all quantum computers. And what we see is for a certain window of errors, uh, we can actually beat the standard gate model. So once you have small, but not too large errors, uh, it's actually better to use our compiler compared to any gate model on a mathematical way. Okay, so as a conclusion, uh, real world problems uh, contain k-body terms, so they are hypergraphs. And on top of this, they also have side conditions. So this is uh, something that you cannot represent as a graph, but as an additional list of conditions. Uh, Cubis is a, a, a workaround for that, how you can encode this. However, this gives you a large overhead, uh, either in qubits or energy, land, uh, energy scale. And with our transformation, we can actually completely circumvent uh, this Kubo transformation and then the encoding and we do a direct encoding of higher order and constraint uh, problems natively. Um, and so this is my, on the left side is my research group uh, at the University of Innsbruck and on the right side, this is uh, the company that works on the compiler. And uh, so this is my email address, uh, as I mentioned, so I'm uh, very interested in, in collaborations uh, on both sides, so industry as well as uh, research related. Okay, thank you very much.